Welcome everyone. After five weeks of hard working, having the collaboration of many experts and many FAG staffs, we finally arrived to the last seminar organized by the FAG Education Commission. I'm sure that the topic that we will address today is very relevant of, for many coaches around the world and a key element to develop gymnastics with quality and respect for each participants. Once again, I would like to invite Professor Dr. Keith Russell to share part of his tremendous experience with us. Please welcome Dr. Russell. Hello again, Marco. Great to be so here. Thank you. thank you very much to join us again. So I hope you are doing fine. We are really, really happy to have you with us again. Well, my pleasure again to be here and uh, to see you. We haven't been together for a long time, Marco, but it's uh, nice to see you and nice to work with FIG again. Yeah, great. I, I will not repeat what my friend Itseko Mogossi said a few weeks ago. I will just point out that Dr. Keith was recognized by, uh, as an emeritus professor by the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. It means the university and us as an education commission, we recognize his experience and his tremendous work to the gymnastics community. This is a very important information that we have to highlight every time. So thank you very much, Dr. Keith, one more time. And please, the, this virtual stage, stage is yours. And we'll chat again at the end of the presentation, Marco. Nice to meet you again. So here is the plan for this session. Uh, we're going to uh, do a very brief history of uh, the evolution of gymnastics from adults to children. We will have also a quick overview of physical growth relevant to gymnastics coaching. Then a brief discussion on early and late maturation and a fair part of the presentation will be looking at some of the effects of intensive training on growing tissues and hopefully some suggestions as how we can mitigate any negative consequences of that. Uh, but let me begin as I did with my last presentation, the first in this series, uh, by stating my conviction that participation in gymnastic sports is one of the very best activities for children. Uh, gymnastic gyms are magical places for children. They're full of healthy stimuli. Uh, they provide children with physical, motor, social, and psychological benefits that far outweigh any risks. Uh, the very first seminar uh, I presented some by children participating in gymnastic sports. And there's an article at the bottom of the page here that states, uh, that it's a fairly recent article, again, on uh, the effects of gymnastic activities, particularly on physical growth. So some facts about coaching growing athletes. First of all, growing tissues do not respond to intensive training the same as adult tissue. Some injuries are unique to growing tissues. They, they don't happen in adult tissues. And knowing these will help prevent injuries. And finally, knowing how growing tissues respond to training stimuli allows coaches to optimize training and minimize overuse. In the medical, scientific, and educational communities, gymnastics used to be considered a paragon of sports. Paragon meaning the ultimate example of healthy activity for the human body. Now, gymnastics is often mentioned as being a pariah among sports. That is, it's an example of undesirable, excessive, and even abusive training practices. How 
did gymnastic sports go from being paragon, the ultimate, to being pariah, a bad example? Well, gymnastics changed. We, people in gymnastics, changed gymnastics. You can see 5,000 years ago on these uh, wall paintings in the Beni Hassam tombs in Egypt, you can see the beginning or hints of tumbling of artistic gymnastics, of aerobic gymnastics, of acrobatic gymnastics, of rhythmic gymnastics, of gymnastics for all. And for all of our history, gymnastics was an example of physical excellence, the way to gain physical excellence. It was about skill, confidence, courage. It was about developing bodies, well, healthy bodies, physical specimens. It was about uniformity, poise, fitness, balance, strength, health. Gymnastics was the ultimate in physical perfection and artistry. But most of the historical material on gymnastics was about adults. It was the fit, skillful, artistic adult that was represented. Children were shown in play situations, not in competitive sport. Now, much of the participation in competitive gymnastics is done by children. Before, these were the gymnasts. Now, these are the gymnasts. Quite a difference. So gymnastics has changed. Age has decreased dramatically in gymnastics participation. And even though the minimum age for major international competition has increased to 15 in 1980 and 16 in 1997, even that, in women's artistic gymnastics, the average height of the top gymnast has not increased, even though the age has increased. So this may indicate that the rules still favor early pubertal body types. And perhaps this gives advantage to later and later maturing girls. This is charts showing the age changes, weight changes over time. Training hours have increased greatly. Young children are training far more hours now than Olympic champions trained a few decades ago, 30 to 40 hours a week in some cases. That's equal to what many adults work in a week. And training loads have increased greatly. In artistic gymnastics, young children now experience between 20 and 30,000 high impact loadings per year. Now this has positive and negative consequences. And single landing loads can be as high as 20 times body weight instantaneously between two internal bones. So these are high forces. Again, can be positive, can be negative. Rhythmic gymnastics, Young children now experience very high numbers of asymmetric and unilateral movements, often at extreme ranges of movement. Trampoline gymnastics, new rule changes uh, of increasing flight time or counting flight time in the judging may develop uh, compression loads that are much higher than they used to be. 
more repetitions. So we don't know if that's going to lead to new injury patterns. But training loads in all gymnastics sports have increased greatly. Flexibility is becoming more contortion-like in several of our sports. And several of our sports, amplitude is valued more than symmetry. And of course, skill levels in gymnastics have increased dramatically. Young gymnasts are training and performing skills that are far more difficult than skills performed by adult champions just a few years ago. And really, can spectators differentiate between a two and a half twisting somersault and a three and a half twisting somersault? Maybe some judges have difficulty differentiating that. Do they appreciate multiple twisting, multiple somersaulting, tumbling series better than high, cleanly executed skills that land safely? Do spectators appreciate complex feats with hand apparatus performed in extreme ranges of body contortions? or? Do they appreciate artistry and elegance? And of course, all of these changes are, have general acceptance in gymnastics communities. And of course, it's impossible to turn the clock backwards. But the purpose of these sessions, of course, is to find ways of mitigating any of the negative trends that have evolved. Let's look at a quick overview of physical growth. First, we must understand the difference between chronological age and biological age. Chronological age, that is the journey to maturity. Chronological age is your age in years, months, days, from birth. But biological age, sorry, uh, that journey to maturity, biological age is quite different. We can look at the biological age several ways. Uh, the gold standard, of course, is wrist x-rays. You can see this newborn on the left side here, and the bones of the wrist, the carpal bones, have not even ossified they're still cartilaginous where a five-year-old that is a very big difference in skeletal maturity in biological age you can see here an 11 and 14 year old look at the joints the fingers the proximal growth plates here on the fingers and look here on a 14 year old they're fused or completely fused, but here you can still see growth plates. The bones of the carpals are not fully developed, but here they are fully developed. So there's a difference in skeletal age. If you look at these two, it's pretty obvious what the difference is in biological age and these two individuals. I'll let you look at these two x-rays for a moment, radiographs, and Figure out which is the eldest. These are two brothers that I coached. And as you can see, this right hand skeletal structure is less mature. Look at the styloid post of the ulna here. Look here. This is much more developed. Look here at the... Uh, proximal growth plates on the fingers and look here these are less developed these are less developed so this is the younger skeletally younger of the two brothers but in reality chronologically 
this right-hand brother is two years older chronologically than his younger but skeletally more mature brother. So there's two years difference in their age and there's really four years difference in their skeletal maturity. So chronological age and biological age are quite different. The most used measurement of biological age is reproductive maturity, looking at secondary sexual indicators. So breast development, pubic hair patterns, we can determine uh, biological age differences by looking at secondary sexual indicators. Or, of course, we can look at hand x-rays. In a typical school class of eight-year-old students, that's like third grade in school, there is most often a five to six year variation in their maturity, in their biological age. Their chronological ages are all eight years of age, but their biological ages will range from below six to 10 or above. So they're rather different biologically than they are chronologically. So let's take a brief look at normal growth patterns. After two years of age, growth is pretty steady until puberty. That is, children will grow about two inches, that's five centimeters per year, every year from age two to puberty. This view, uh, the graph, shows it in a better way. Uh, this is the rate of growth. So you can see that we grow fastest prenatally, before birth. As soon as we're born, growth slows until about two years of age. And then it's pretty steady until puberty. And then, of course, it accelerates dramatically as shown on this graph. Rapid deceleration, slow deceleration, steady growth, rapid growth, rapid deceleration, slow deceleration, and the end of growing. The takeoff into the pubertal growth begins and the feet start the growth first. So we're going to come back and look at that. And then growth reaches peak velocity. That's when you are growing at the fastest rate. Pubertal growth spurt is a time of dramatic changes for all children, but particularly for gymnasts. And we're going to discuss this quite a bit in the rest of this session. On average, girls are two years in advance of boys on entering puberty. Every child passes through exactly the same stages, but the tempo and the timing of passing through each stage is highly variable. The average age at takeoff to the pubertal growth spurt, in girls it's 10, in boys, it's 12. So that's in the general population. On average, girls will begin their pubertal growth spurt at 10 and boys at 12. The moment of peak velocity in growth or peak height velocity is 12 in girls on average, 14 in boys on average. Now, those two milestones, the takeoff to puberty and the time of peak height velocity when you're growing in height, the fastest rate, those two milestones are really important for coaches to know. Peak weight gain follows peak height by about three months. 
So we grow up and then we fill out, we grow outward. But that's an important indicator. We know that they're going to have their peak weight gain from growth about three months after peak height. Peak bone gain, and then the peak in bone density, laying down bone tissue, follows peak height by about seven months. And peak strength gain follows peak height velocity by about eight months in females and one year in males. That is, the child is gaining strength from growth at the fastest rate of his or her life. And that's a dramatic change in males. It's a less dramatic change in females. Menarche, menarche is it, the first menstrual cycle, follows peak height, by, peak height velocity by about one year. So about one year after peak uh, height velocity, the girls will experience their first menstrual cycle. By the way, hospitalization injuries in the general population peak exactly at peak height velocity. And that's also the case in gymnastics. That's the time we have the highest injury rates in our sports. And because growth plates are the largest at peak height velocity. They're the widest that will ever be during growth. That's when growth plate injuries are also the highest. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And that's exactly the time of the highest dropout from gymnastic sports. It should be clear that coaches need to know these two important milestones. The easiest method to, is to measure children's feet every three to six months, because the first thing that begins to grow at the pubertal growth spurt are the feet. The pattern is pretty much the same for all children. Feet grow first, legs, followed by arms and hands. So if you begin about one year before the average takeoff, so before 10 with girls that by nine years old, you could start measuring their feet. Place the heel in the same place each time and trace the full foot. Between measurements, now the measurements must be the same all the time, like three month intervals or four month intervals or six months intervals. It doesn't really matter which of those, but each measurement must be in the same time interval. Well, those lines will be fairly similar until the growth spurt begins. Then you'll see a greater distance between the lines. And that will indicate fairly clearly that the takeoff to the pubertal growth spurt has begun. So you can have fairly accurately the time when the gymnast has begun their pubertal growth spurt. An important milestone for coaches to know. You will know that about two years after that, you're going to, around two years, you're going to have the peak rate of growth. And about a year after that, you'll have my menarche. And about a year after that, you'll have peak strength gain in boys. So these are important milestones for coaches to know. When the growth rate begins to slow two years later, you'll notice that there's less distance between the measurement lines. The gymnast will then have reached peak height velocity and their growth rate is beginning to slow. They're still growing, but they're growing at a slower and slower rate. Body composition, well before puberty, girls have about 10 to 15% more body fat, adipose tissue, than boys. After puberty, girls have 50% more body fat than boys. 
This is an important, has important implications for gymnastics, both physically and psychologically. This natural increase in adipose tissue means that the percentage of the girl's body weight, that is fat, increases relevant to the non-fat tissue. And there will be a decrease in the girl's relative strength. That is their strength relative to their body weight. So they may be stronger, but the change in the percentage of muscle tissue to fat tissue means that they'll be relatively weaker going through this period of time. Now, coaches can mitigate this post-pubertal decrease in relative strength in females by, of course, increasing strength training. It's also the optimal time of their life to increase their strength. We'll see in a moment that we also want to be decreasing impacts at this time, but we, increasing strength is a very, very good uh, strategy. Uh, plan weight stabilization uh, sessions or nutrition sessions with nutrition professionals at this time. Uh, prepare gymnasts psychologically for this change. Change routines to more mature versions of their routines. Uh, male gymnasts at this time have a dramatic growth spurt in muscle tissue and their relative strength actually increases in puberty. But for the female gymnast, this change should be prepared for and uh, training should be changed. This pubertal growth period is a critical time for bone accretion, particularly in females. As mentioned in my last seminar, 25% of total adult bone mineral is laid down in the two peak years of pubertal growth. This is as much bone mineral as will be lost in all the postmenopausal years in females. So the more bone tissue that girls, females, lay down in this period, the better for them for the rest of their lives. And gymnastics is, as we saw in the last seminar, the very best sport for bone tissue accrual. And of course, good nutrition is critical to this bone tissue accrual. This is not a time of life to have severe or bad weight loss strategies using restricted diets imposed on these gymnasts. They need very good nutrition at this time of their lives for optimal bone accrual. A big complication in all of this, of course, is that individuals vary tremendously in the magnitude and the timing of their growth. Some gymnasts are early maturers, or some children are early maturers. That means that they begin their pubertal growth spurts 12 months or more before average. So if the average age is 10, early maturers would start their pubertal growth spurt at nine or even eight years of age. Some children are late maturing. That is, they begin their pubertal growth spurt 12 months or later than average. So the average age is 10 for girls. Some will start at 11, some will start at 12 or even later. This average age of takeoff of 10 is only the average. Two years earlier or two years later are normal. So these are perfectly normal biological differences in children. It's not uncommon to see the term delayed maturation used, particularly in medical literature, instead of late maturation. This is really a poor term to apply to late matures because it implies that something caused the delay. Late maturing 
is a very natural and normal process. It's just the same as early maturing is very natural. Early maturing is not accelerated. Late maturing is not delayed. They're just differences from normal. Here's some examples of uh, gymnasts who are similar ages, if not exactly the same age, but very, very different in maturation. These gymnasts all competed against each other in the same age category, but their maturation was very different. So it's obvious that gymnasts of the same age can be very different in maturation. Thus, their adaptations to training will also be very different. And they will be, the adaptations will be changing as they grow. And this must be understood and accounted for in coaches' planning. Early maturing children are generally taller and heavier for their age than late maturing peers, as indicated in those pictures of the gymnasts. Early maturing children will excel in sports where larger size, greater speed, and early strength is required. It'll give them an advantage in team sports and, and, and sports such as speed swimming and athletics. The early maturers will definitely have an advantage in these sports. Late maturing children, however, generally catch up to the early matures in height in late adolescence. So in late adolescence, there's no difference. But in early adolescence, early, early puberty, there's a big difference very often. Often those late maturing gymnasts catch up in height, but body weight is usually less. So late maturity typically features small stature during the growing years, low fat during the growing years, narrow hips during the growing years, higher strength to weight ratio during the growing years. And the, these, of course, these features are highly desirable traits for women's artistic gymnastics, and really for all gymnastics. Thus, late maturing children gravitate to gymnastic sports, or they're selected for gymnastic sports, and they are successful in gymnastic sports. Gymnastics does not cause short stature and late maturation, nor does basketball the playing of basketball cause tall stature or early maturation. But late maturation does have implications to growth plate injuries, and we'll see that in a moment. If an early mature is two years early and a late mature is two years later than average, remember they're both normal. The late maturing gymnast, in our case, will have growth plates, those growing structures, four additional years after the early mature has stopped growing. So if there is stresses put on growth plates that are negative, those stresses are put on those growth plates for four additional years. That's a very, very important fact that all coaches must understand. This has profound implications for planning and training. Does gymnastics stunt growth? It's a, been a question for many, many years. There were two very interesting scientific papers argued in the same edition of the Pediatric Exercise Science Journal. There are the two papers. One paper, group of scientists argued, yes, it does. And another group of scientists argued, no, it doesn't. 
So in 2011, the FIG invited the authors of those papers, plus other eminent researchers in the world, five on each side of the argument, invited them to Lausanne, Switzerland, and spent a weekend debating all the papers for and against those arguments. And that group of imminent researchers published an article in the journal Sports Medicine. There's a reference to that journal. You can read that, get that online, just click that online link. And these were the four conclusions. Final adult height of both female and male gymnasts is not compromised by gymnastics. There is no credible evidence that gymnastics training alters growth of upper body or lower body segments. The majority of gymnasts are shown to be late matures, but they have the same pattern of growth, timing and tempo as late maturing non-gymnasts. And the available data are inadequate to address any effects of intensive gymnastics training on the endocrine system. And here's a very, very recent paper, uh, 2018, that summarizes the effects of gymnastic activities on bone accrual. So you can take a look at that paper as well. But recall, late maturing and many, many gymnasts are late maturing, have growth plates longer. Therefore, they have the mechanical advantage of being small for longer. And the rules give these gymnasts an advantage, particularly in some of our disciplines, like women's artistic gymnastics. So these late matures are small longer. The rules give them an advantage but they are vulnerable to growth plate injuries for a longer time. Let's take a quick look at bone growth just to understand it better, these, what these growth plates are. Bones begin to ossify in the center, around the center of the bone, and then the ends of the bones begin to ossify, and there remains a cartilaginous growth plate between the bone segments. So it looks, bones grow like this. There's new cartilage forms on this side of the growth plate. There's absorption of the cartilage and uh, laying down of bone cells on the other side, and the bone grows in length, usually by on both ends of the bone. These growth plates are largest around peak height velocity. velocity. So when the athletes are growing at their fastest rate, that's when those growth plates are at their largest and widest. Those growth plates at the ends of long bones are normally subjected to compression loads, and they're well designed for those compression loads. But excessive compression loads can damage and even result in compression fractures. And there is a condition that in the medical literature is called gymnast wrist. You have uh, jumpers' knees and swimmers' shoulders, throwers' elbows, little leaguers' elbow. Now we've also got gymnast wrist. And it's this growth plate, this distal growth plate of the radius bone. Here's an example of a uh oh, take that back. Here's an example of a healthy growth plate. You can see it's nice and clear the growth plate of the radius of the wrist. And here's an example of gymnast wrists. So these were gymnasts who had excessive training, damaged the wrist from compression, too many compressions, too great compressions. And we have cloudy, uh, scalloped damaged growth plate. And there's a very painful wrist and there is some uh, possibility of asymmetric growth of the bones of the forearm. 
So this is a condition that occurs in the growth plates from excessive training. Now these growth plates are interruptions in the structural integrity or structural rigidity of bones and thus they are weaker than the rest of the bone. And the weakness is particularly vulnerable in shear forces and in torsion forces. This is usually when growth, these growth plates are damaged, not in compression. Usually they'll be damaged by shear or torsion. And so coaches must take steps to reduce shear and torsion forces, particularly around peak height velocity. And this is done by reducing under or over rotating somersaults because that produces huge shear forces on the bones of the leg or under or over rotated twisting landings in any of our disciplines gymnasts should land vertically somersaulting twisting should be complete before landing and most especially during the year leading up to and the year after peak height velocity and this is most particular on hard surface landings. So reduce the level of skills that the gymnast trains, particularly on hard surfaces, if the skill will result in large shear or torsion forces. Remember, these athletes are growing rapidly and in the case of females, have reduced relative strength. So the skills that they could do easily one year before, now they're landing short. So reduce those skills. Go back from a double twist, go back to a full twist. Reduce hard surface takeoffs and landings during that period of time. These under-rotated landings cause many injuries to growth plates in gymnasts in landing while still arched is a similar growth plate injury. Instead, coaches should devote more time to training that does not result in large shear and torsion forces, such as more increased physical preparation. A wonderful time to be doing physical preparation training more than before, but be careful with some of the skills that the gymnast was doing. Mental skill training, increase that at this period. Artistry training, increase it. Perfection of technique, increase. Consistency of performance, but of course, reduce skill training on hard surfaces that produce shear or torsion. Modification of this kind of training and extra protection on landings and takeoffs should continue, should start a year before or six months before and continue a year to six months after peak height velocity. Bone growth, is, is, there's just some strange things because the skeleton does not grow at the same rate. For example, the head grows two times in length between childhood and adulthood while the trunk grows three times, and the arm, arms grow four times, and the legs grow five times. So there's asymmetric growth in the skeletal system. Surprisingly, even more, so uh, in each limb there is asymmetric or unequal growth between the top and the bottom of the, of the limb. The leg bones do not grow at the same rate. And even within an individual bone, there isn't the same growth at each end. So let's take the leg, for example. There's the contribution to growth at the hip. So uh, that's the bone, uh, upper bone of the leg. This is the upper bone of the leg, the femur. Well, at the proximal end of that bone, it only accounts for 15% of the growth of the whole leg. The knee area, the distal end of the femur, accounts for 40% of the growth of the leg. And 
the tibia, the main bone of the lower leg, the proximal end of that bone accounts for 27% of the growth of that bone of the leg, where the distal end only accounts for 18%. So you can see two thirds of the total growth of the leg occurs at the knee. These growth plates are growing more rapidly and are very vulnerable to injury during rapid pubertal growth. So again, caution on under-rotated landings during this period of time because so much growth is occurring at the knee joint. So hence the need for modified training to decrease shear and torsion forces. There is, however, another category of growth plates, and these are actually injured more frequently than the growth plates at the end of long bones. These growth plates are more numerous, and they're located between all the tendon attachments to bone. So everywhere a muscle via a tendon attaches to a bone, there is a growth plate. So the bony bumps or the apophyses on bones, where the tendons attached to the bone have a growth plate. So these apophyseal growth plates are always subjected to shear forces because the muscle is pulling on the tendon, which is pulling on the bone, and between the bone and the major part of the bone, between the bump and the major part of the bone, there are many, many, many growth plates. That's how the bone grows in that area. These tendon attachment growth plates, or apophyseal growth plates, are usually injured from overuse. They become inflamed and tender, so apophysitis. This is the most common injury in elite artistic gymnastics, according to the study that we mentioned in the first seminar. There's an example of a apophyseal growth plate at the knee that's very often injured. Too many repetitions, insufficient recovery, excessive volume of training, re-injury. This is an example of the tibial tuberosity at the knee. There's an apophysitis from too much training. It's often called the Oscar Slatter's disease, but it's an apophysitis and very often in gymnastics. The same occurs at the heel, another apophysitis, sometimes called Seaver's disease. But these very often are overuse injuries. And at the hip, you can see many, many, many muscles attach. And there are many, many growth plates at the elbow. So these are very common growth plate injuries in gymnastic sports. Injury can be from excessive concentric contractions or excessive eccentric contractions, such as all landings. And in the cases of takeoffs and landings, of course, there are shear forces on those growth plates. Sometimes the contraction will be so strong and the growth plate is already weakened by excessive training and the, the, the bony apophysis will break, will fracture, will break off, it will avulse. So we have avulsion fractures of the apophysis. So these are growth plate injuries. And there's another complication in this, in that bones grow and that growth of the bone, the bone growing in length, stretches muscles. And that's what actually stimulates the muscles to grow in length. They grow in length because the, grow, the bone has already grown and stretches the muscle. It's really the same physiological process that happens when we do flexibility training. We stretch muscles, they respond to that stretch by increasing their length. Well, 
you can see here when athletes are growing rapidly, the muscles are always catching up to the bone growth and are tractioned. They're tight. This tractioning increases the problem of avulsion fractures. Adults will tear the tendons, but children avulse a piece of bone off. So coaches should reduce shear torsion forces and increase flexibility training, of course, during this rapid growth. This tightness is greatest at peak height velocity, and it increases the forces on the tendon attachment, and of course, exacerbates the overuse problem and increases the injury on growth plates. And late maturing gymnasts, remember, and we have many of them, have these growth plates for a longer period of time. So in summary, there are two kinds of growth plates at the ends of long bones and at tendons. One is at the end of long bone, is very vulnerable to shear and torsion forces, sometimes damaged by excessive compression. And the ones at the, with the tendon attachments, of course, are very vulnerable to overuse and sometimes are evolved. We should modify training in the pubertal period by decreasing plyometrics, decreasing the number of repetitions, decreasing shear and torsion forces. Those are the under-rotated saltos and twists. Do less unilateral training, do more bilateral training. Increase the percentage of other types of training. And of course, early detection and modified training can prevent the most serious injuries. We should closely monitor the tenderness near the growth plates. And of course, coaches should know the growth milestones, the takeoff and the peak height velocity. Measure gymnast height, measure gymnast foot growth, Long training sessions must incorporate strategies to reduce high repetitions, better monitoring of impact loads, better recovery so that we get fewer overuse injuries. We should try to reduce excessive tissue laxity, excessive stretching, excessive unilateral overuse, and extreme postures that negatively affecting joints. And of course, we should make training adjustments during rapid growth. So our history recommends that in the future, we should provide gymnasts with healthier training environments. We can learn from our history and of course educate and we can educate and we can educate, and maybe in some cases we have to legislate some changes to our gymnastics training. Yeah, yeah thank you very, very much. Thank you, Marco. Yeah, uh, I have no doubt that your presentation needs to be more than once. And I'm, I'm saying that because you summarize. So thank you, Keith. Um, I have no doubt that your presentation uh, should be seen more than once. And I'm saying that because you summarize years and years of scientific development. And it is not so easy. My short experience as a teacher at the university shows that it's not, it's not easy uh, to present in a very short term, in a very clear like you did, so many information and so complex system. So thank you to, to do that for us. Thank you, Marco. Okay, we, we still have minutes, a couple of minutes. Uh, I would like to ask a question if do, you don't mind. Not at all, shoot away. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we recently incorporated uh, a new topic in our foundations course of the FAG academies uh, concerning uh, the aging process. So as, as you show, we agree that the, the gymnastics uh, activities include all group age. So we, we still have uh, senior adults uh, practicing gymnastics. 
what can you say to us about the, the recent uh, knowledge uh, that came from the science about sports and aging or uh, senior adults? Ah, yeah, that's the other end of the spectrum, uh, Marcos. Uh, just to, for our viewers of these uh, seminars, uh, let me explain. There are the uh, FIG has education academies in all seven disciplines, uh, all seven sports of gymnastics. And there's a level one and a level two and a level three academy. But there's also an underpinning foundations course to all of those. Um, and that foundations course does uh, cover the full spectrum from child to senior uh, adults. And so your question, Marco, of course, uh, as we age through adulthood and into, uh, like me, uh, elderly adulthood, um, our tissues still respond to training. And the same as the child when we when we stress the tissues, the tissues adapt to that stress and they change. And the 70, 80 year old uh, can change their tissues just as can the child. They can have injuries too, just like the child for overuse. But more often, uh, a big part of the aging uh, process is disuse atrophy. In other words, the adult is getting atrophy of tissues through disuse. Well, do the opposite. Use the tissues and they will adapt and they will improve. And one of the most desirable ways to do that could be through adult gymnastics. And of course, your area of most expertise is the gymnastratas and the festivals and wow, that's a, I mean, that's a, the other end of the spectrum from what I've been talking about, but uh, very important. And uh, thank you for bringing that up and mentioning it because uh, I better go out and do some exercise, <laughs> some gymnastic <laughs> exercise. Oh, As you do, Marco, you have, uh, you, you have a large group that uh, it's just wonderful what you people are doing in, in, uh, in your country and in your city and university. Yeah, you're right. Uh, our Gymnastics for All community is growing and growing and it represents a huge amount of people really engaged in gymnastics. So many of them are uh, adults or uh, seniors adults. So it's important to hear from you that gymnastics can be very important for this uh, part of this population. So my dear friend, I, I have to say thank you, thank you very much one more time and I hope to see you in another opportunity and I wish you a very good summertime in Canada. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you. Kit. thank you very thank much. You. Best wishes to your family. So my dear friends, as you can see, we have reached the end of this series of online events. All of them are already available on the FIG Education channel on YouTube. Um, on behalf of the FIG Education Commission, I would like to thank all the experts that have been participating in these events, all the members of the FIG Education Commission, and especially the FIG Communication, Media, and IT staffs that was really important to run these events. Of course, I have to mention, I have to thank you, all the FIG, FIG authorities that supported very much our uh, idea to run these online events. Thank you very much for all of you. So, we know that our events had already thousands of views, and we know also that it generates a lot of sharing information between coaches and specialists. We hope the, our community uh, could join or continue following our events in the YouTube. And we hope these people find good information, quality information about gymnastics. We certainly uh, 
have to reinforce our goal to promote quality knowledge at the FAG. This is very important to keep tracking and to keep working in a good way. So I would like to thank you very much and I see you in another opportunity. Thank you, bye bye. Thank you.